Hey everyone, thanks everyone for joining and um, thanks um, to all our new uh, audience who decided to just join this talk. Once again, it's a BA Excellence Conference that is organized by the global um, EPAM BA community. We're all super excited to have you today. And uh, just before I go on mute, I would like to give you a few useful uh, pre-session notes. First thing first, please remember that we have four different uh, webinars running additionally to the conference sessions. Uh, you can still find them on their community page, so don't forget to check them out. Uh, to have a more engaging atmosphere, uh, we also invite our speakers and all um, people from the audience to join the virtual rooms where you can continue chatting with the speakers after each of the session. Uh, for our colleagues watching us online, uh, just a friendly reminder that the session is being recorded and the recording will be available in about a week's time. Also, once the session starts, please remember to drop your questions um, either in their community page or in a comment section or in the YouTube directly. We will try to answer as many of them as possible after the presentation. We also encourage you to share your feedback about the presentation when it's over. So please remember about it because it helps us uh, improve next year. And um, moving forward with the presentation itself, our next speakers are Irina Skripnik, Andrei um, Areshenko, and uh, Irina Karasova. And they will, um, their topic um, is the road to new product thinking for the whole team, how we do it. And just before I hand it over to you, to you all, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction. So first you will hear from Irina Skripnik, who works as a product manager. She launched her first product on the market in 2009, and she is an adept of management 3.0. Through her experience, Ira found that the product mindset radically changes team behavior she has conducted more than five successful product-oriented transformations, and she is a senior product manager at EPA. The second speaker is Andrei um, Areshenko. He has over 16 years of experience in IT, grounded on solid technical background and architecture skills. He is an expert in e-commerce domain, project management, agile and safe frameworks, planning and execution of transformation projects. He is building and optimizing delivery processes able to supervise delivery on both project and program level. And the third speaker is Irina Karasova. Having marketing background, she started a career as a business analyst in 2011, grow uh, in business analysis, product management, and project uh, management skill sets. Inspired to discover the world of transformation in practice in stream product owner role. And um, at this stage, it's it about me, and you guys, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Raman. Uh, could you help me with my presentation? Oh, great. Thank you very much. OK, hi, everybody. Today we're talking about product mindset. And I've got a funny story to tell you. Imagine, I joined a new software project as a lead product manager. The project was developed by a big global IT company. I cannot say its name, it's a little secret. Okay, then I conducted the research of this product. I discovered three important things. First, we were highly skilled architects and amazing developers of this project. Second, uh, the product consisted uh, uh, of more than three or four product models. And finally, the models didn't work together and the teams didn't communicate with each other. And the most tragic thing, it was already on production stage. I was completely taken aback. And uh, I started digging. What's the problem? Why? Bingo. They didn't have both business and product calls. They were fighting for the resources uh, against each other. 
they worked only the stakeholders and forgot about their customers. They managed uh, to plan and estimate their activities but failed to develop on time. They did the wrong things at the wrong time with the wrong people. Uh, what can I do? I thought to myself. So now I'm going uh, to give you a list of uh, recipes that helped me many times. All of them lead to creating the product mindset in a team. And uh, initially, uh, initially, we, along with product manager and architects, analyzed the product and their architecture for perspective of value delivery. What can we do quickly and efficiently? How can we structure discovery and delivery from the idea to the end consumer? Everyone will have uh, their own answer. Because it depends on the customer's profiles, how flexible your architecture is, and how advanced your development technologies are. But even if you have monolithic solution, there is still a way out, such as internal open source, for example. Uh, if a team understands who they are serving and what benefits we are providing, they do it with joy. And this is the first step forward forming a product mindset. Next step, uh, we conducted a series of workshops with the uh, business and business stakeholders to discuss our goals and objectives. Together, we, we filed out um, we learned canvas model, vision, formulated goals, identified the most important uh, ones and defined metrics of them. Uh, this allowed the team to hear the business and users and for business to communicate uh, their tasks to the teams. For collaborative work, uh, we use World Cathy method, uh, which permitted us to engage quite a number of participants. The recommended group uh, size of such a method is not more than eight or nine people, and the number of groups depends on talents of your facilitator. Uh, it's important uh, that a facilitator is an external person standing above the fray. From mm -hmm, and so, what next? Uh, we Disparate team. From disparate team, we have formed inspired team that understand that way working for. And from disappointed business, we have a business that has become a part of the team. And uh, this is uh, are my second three pills: vision, transparency, and team. Okay. Uh, we formed product teams for each value streams. Uh, the composition included product manager, architect, designer, product analyst, or some CGM analyst, uh, delivery manager, and product owner. Uh, product owner uh, works with uh, two teams, product and delivery, possess business knowledge and develops it within the team, development team. Uh, this allowed us to improve communication, stop separating discovery and delivery. Um, as the team is responsible to end-to-end -end delivery and value, and uh, form unified backlog that included business and architectural in initiatives, uh, technical depth and research. Uh, and my mixture here product team, backlog, and responsibility. How will all of this work? OK, uh, we have a group of people uh, who share a common goal 
uh, we have, have named them uh, a team, but how are they going to work together? Oh, it's, um, give me a minute. It's uh, simple. Um, a unified meetings rhythm to keep the heart beating in uh, unison. You can choose any framework for uh, uh, all of these. I don't know what 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 do you want. Our teams are still uh, very young uh, for complex frameworks like uh, through Scrum, for example. So uh, we call uh, this framework uh, the path to the Scrum. This is a schedule for taking mixtures and peels and to check the health of the product and the team. Additionally, uh, we implemented uh, quarterly business reviews and meeting with stakeholders, uh, biweekly, for example, to ensure that everyone is always on the same page. Uh, you can uh, check uh, two circles uh, with product team and development team uh, in this slide. Okay, uh, the remaining challenge uh, is to understand how and for what a healthy organism, no, sorry, product, healthy product team can develop its product mindset. And uh, I have a, an answer. So, we have uh, arrived a reason for developing a product mindset with the team for adaptivity, ability to change, listen uh, to users, market and stakeholders, quickly receive feedback and deliver value. Um, note uh, that we have a very large section in the area of problem validation and experiments, including on production. Uh, and next, okay, here I have left you several notes and description what exactly we did in the teams to the change the mindset. You can always return to the summary and uh, practical recommendation. You can check that it was a um, workshop with product practices, okay, a lot of workshops, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, interesting meetings uh, for discuss uh, about um, a roadmap processes and uh, forming of it. And uh, what else? Uh, what's the, what's very important? Um, it uh, it was a product voice. Or in all of these uh, events or meetings or documents. I think that it's a good idea for uh, growing a product mindset. Okay, and uh, if we talk about adaptive paradigm and product mindset and product thinking, uh, we can see that Product practices, value streams, and team-centric method are very good ideas for this. Okay, and uh, my colleague Andre will talk about how development teams become adaptive and product-oriented. So, Andre, over to you. Thank you, Irina. So, speed is essential speed is a key for efficiency of products approaches and product practices Alex could you please help with my part of presentations
Okay, let's speak uh, about efficiency of product approaches and practices a little bit. Uh, it's essential. It's essential to get timely feedback from users. But how can we improve our efficiency? How we can improve efficiency of product approaches and uh, maximize uh, value from product mindset and product pra practices? Andre, could you share the presentation, please? Uh, do you have access to it? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, you should find uh, somewhere sharing button, button it uh, should be available already. Oh yes, I, I see it now. It works. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you a lot. Let's continue and uh, speed is essential speed is uh, very important uh, for product practices and approaches and but how can we get faster how to enhance our pace uh, let us analyze this challenge through the lens of team structure and delivery paradigm So uh, the project-based paradigm, which is predictive paradigm or whatever, it's usually built like that. You have some horizontal system owners. Uh, it could be component owners. It could be uh, the subsystem owners. It could be as big as front, back, middleware, whatever. But these guys own the system code. It is important. and. There are vertical guys, usually they are called project managers. Uh, sometimes you don't call them project managers, it could be product managers, it doesn't matter. But these are people uh, whose job is to somehow give task to these guys and then get their work and integrate it together. So uh, that's what they to do, execute uh, an end-to-end -end project. Either you create a dedicated team or you don't create uh, a team. Even you work with all these system owners in order to do what is required for the project. So we have multiply product managers. Uh, once again, can them product managers uh, call them? Doesn't matter. They are the people who manage system owners. Uh, so. The next slide, uh, we, what issue does it cause? Very similar, very, very mm, primitive issue. Every project manager or vertical wants to deliver fast. And then for that, the dependencies of multiply system or components or whatever, and they have to be thoroughly planned together. But the problem is each system or subsystem or components has very complicated sort of priorities. So you can move fast, so you can't move fast because you are linked to other people and there is no single organization entity, the system that can deliver value fast because in order to deliver value, you have to bring this subsystem together. It's uh, similar uh, like on this picture, uh, sec race and uh, we are chained to each other. It's so complicated thing. So this is a slightly different way. We can see uh, on the next slide. And this is the key scenes. Uh, please pay attention. There are teams uh, that own components, uh, single components, multiply companies, doesn't matter. So when you get the feature, this feature has to be decomposed between different teams. Yeah. 
and then a team work uh, on it, uh, then they integrate and test the solution. And oft, only after that, uh, you remember the graph uh, in previous slide, only after that, you can deploy something to the customer. So uh, the good thing, it's very logical. Yeah, every team knows what they own, uh, very clear ownership, but ownership of what? It's a quick, it, it is key question, ownership of code. Uh, on the other side, whatever is important to the customer, it's not the code. Customer doesn't care about the code. Customer cares about the features and managing features in the system, it's not very easy. To the drawback of such system, or maybe everything is right. Why not? Yeah, uh, and uh, this is a lot of waiting for each other. It's the key issue uh, of this system. Teams wait for each other, integration is complicated, uh, and every team has their own priorities. Uh, and that is very true. There is one important thing here, teams own components and they don't structurally means he, uh, he are good people, that's why I care, but uh, structurally they care about their components, not about the end result. And this, uh, this is what they paid for. They focus on what they call local optimum. I want to optimize my components and I don't care about uh, your components uh, uh, and uh, about components of uh, other teams. This is one of the key issue of uh, this system and uh, this is one of the key issue that we have to address. Or oh, other, a pretty trivial. Uh, indeed, so this waiting so long time, you get value uh, only after integration. But one of the key since here is that developers, uh, but not developers, engineers, testers, uh, whoever, they detach from what business wants. It's very important. They detach from business value. They focus on improving only the local components, uh, architectural components, technical components, not uh, business features and business values. So is there an alternative is there any other model that we could get organized to solve these issues yes answer yes and uh, you have to realize uh, realign the organization uh, to what matters to the customer because uh, this is what uh, we are paid for uh, okay so the alternative is brought is uh, uh, 2005 by Craig Warman, uh, one of the famous software uh, guys. So, and this is how it looks. Let's uh, focus here. Uh, uh, this is key to what we are trying to do. Uh, instead of what we are create such teams that instead of owning components, they own features. Uh, then in order to implement the feature, they can make change to any component of the system. This is one single backlog. Every team can take anything from this backlog, implement it, uh, and uh, testing it, can get feedback and uh, other all necessary uh, things. This model solves some problems. Uh, engineers become much more involved in the end result. They see what they are doing. Uh, they see the business result. They see the business value. They care about. Uh, uh, customer needs, they feel it, it all uh, sounds good, I hope. But they are very interesting points and certain dangers. Let's talk about uh, a bit about the dangers of this model and some risk. Uh, this model looks attractive because every feature is owned by the team. Teams work for what is important for the customer, everyone is happy. But you have to make teams make changes to almost every component in the system. So they multiply challenges with that. Uh, if the system too complicated or even complex, uh, then teams have to know each and every components in this uh, system, how it's possible. Uh, the other challenge, teams make changes into these components at the same time, and it would be a mess and it would be uh, difficult to maintain design and architecture. 
uh, and how align these vertical teams together so then they work in, in the synergy of the whole system moves uh, up and uh, not just one feature. So this are really uh, concerns and this concerns should be uh, addressed uh, uh, to implement successfully this model. So in this model solve issues, the key issue of engineers working like in a startup uh, for the customer. Uh, on the other hand, it's not easy model to implement because uh, the complication of multiple teams working on the same components at the same times, and uh, you need to align them together. So, this is just an, another illustration of the same model, some issues of same approach. So to, on top, uh, we have classical project-based delivery. You have subsystem, you have uh, features coming from the customer the, uh, under discovery and the, during decomposition. And then uh, they decompose between different system and components and they fall into different backlogs with different priority. And they have to be integrated. So we have discussed the issue, the model we expect. And uh, let's take these little green people from uh, top part uh, and from each and every subsystem to the one team. Uh, it's easy when you have front, back, or whatever, middleware, uh, or whatever uh, else. So you combine them into one team so that this team as a team has expertise in all subsystem. You bring in everything into this team, everything to make is autonomous, to deliver to the customer, and even to take the fast feedback look. So this is how we can form feature teams. They are called feature teams, obviously, because they are focused on features, not uh, on business value, rather than on architecture entities and architecture components. But truly, really, uh, what I want to understand uh, from this slide, uh, inherent structural issue in the classical model uh, in, in the top, uh, in the predictive model or project model, whatever you do, they do not allow you to release features fast. You can improve uh, the communication, you can improve engineering practices, you can improve this and you can, can improve that, but uh, the, there are structure issues that we try to address and this is the way how we try this. Uh, so simply say <laughs> there are a coupling between how the organization is structured and how the system that it works on uh, is architectured. So if you have, for example, three departments in your organization and you will have three pass compile because every part of this organization want to have a piece of the pie and uh, to have uh, own something, to have power, to have... Uh, uh, so the overall architecture also depends on the org structure and vice versa. If you have certain architecture components, uh, don't be surprised if there are teams around these components. Most organizational, uh, most, most organizations are built uh, like that. There are arch architectural entities and organizational entities around this uh, architecture uh, com components. And some organizational entities, uh, they, uh, they even can, can fight. Uh, it's like uh, what, what we call it. Uh, it's like living organism teams uh, organize like teams fight between themselves, each one trying to get more uh, importance, more uh, prominence, uh, even more power. So, and this is, is what we want to get away from. We are trying to increase autonomy in order to increase adaptivity. We want to increase autonomy more like a startup uh, kind, uh, uh, like, like startup team uh, and uh, where each, team, whatever you call it, can deliver something meaningful to the customer. Business value can deliver business feature. So, and uh, this forces us to break away from the model of code ownership, because if you want every team to be able to change every components, uh, then it means that code is not owned. And this is totally 
counterintuitive for many people because uh, like if the code is not owned uh, what uh, do we do with that and to summarize uh, uh, my part uh, it's uh, like easy to draw a powerpoint slide but what about reality right uh, how to organize it how to make sure that through uh, that though they don't mess up the code and design and architecture have to make sure that these teams really know all these components uh, it's easy when you have for example three subsystems uh, but if you have 500 components what do you do right so uh, we have developed uh, approved framework that guides uh, organization with our assistance through the necessary transformation and changes uh, to their path to adaptivity and uh, for example in a recent in the recent engagement uh, one such organization which a complex uh, environment involving three product over uh, 15 companies team, hundreds of architectural companies, several technology stack and pro pro programming languages, and even legacy components, uh, monoliths, uh, successfully implement these changes. Uh, next, please. Uh, clearly, the successful implementation of this team structure required uh, through a uh, mature engineering practices and the adoption of different approaches uh, such as in open source practices, components, mentors, guilds, isolation practices, and so on. Uh, this slide illustrates best uh, practices implemented or modified and improved within the uh, this challenge and uh, entire process of implementing from the initial analysis to the first print in the new model. Uh, and uh, its stabilization took uh, less than a year. And remarkably, it was possible to achieve uh, these results in terms of reducing uh, time to market for initiatives and topics uh, without compromising quality. For illustration, one of the key metrics, defect containment, also showed improvement. So thank you a lot for your attention and let me conclude my part and turn the floor over the next speaker, Irina. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andre. Uh, I will talk about uh, backlog management and the challenges that we face here. And um, um, as you might guess, um, it's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, I invite you to join me as we explore um, the ins and outs of this dynamic landscape. Uh, first of all, uh, let's go back to one of my previous projects uh, where our backlog was full of ideas from users. It was like uh, having a zoo of creativity with each idea wanting attention. However, our development team's ability to handle these ideas was like trying to fit an elephant into a phone booth. It just didn't work quite well. Imagine the oldest idea, a decade old, uh, still valid, but of low business priority and high complexity. So it could mature faster than it could be implemented, actually. Um, fast forward to our current project, and we encounter all the same challenges. We are dealing uh, with a multitude of end users, uh, exceeding 50,000, and we are eager to hear their voices. Uh, numerous business stakeholders whose support and involvement are crucial to making the product valuable for their company. A constrained development team capacity. Resources are always limited, but the proportion of what we want and what we can results uh, in the huge pressure we face as the product team. In light of these challenges, uh, we recognize the need uh, for a clear approach and criteria on how to fill and prioritize the backlog in a transparent manner for our business stakeholders and end users. So, uh, these are the approaches we use and see their value even in the very short term. The first is a proactive approach to our product development. 
Sometimes uh, product teams are focused on the successful juggling of backlog items they got from requesters, trying to prioritize them and implement the most valuable ones. We are sure that we as product owners may propose uh, more value within the core product development strategy based on the company's goals and uh, user research. Being focused on high-level goals, we still accept the direct request for implementation, but we may also provide the value the end users could not predict and request directly. We are not just bystanders, we are actively shaping the future. So the second is intake entity introduction. Um, actually, intake uh, is not a backlog entity, but uh, a kind of Preable clock entity where requesters uh, should describe their need and provide justification. Uh, it's like a movie trailer giving us a quick look at what's coming. This, steps, uh, this step helps us uh, to filter the ideas, ensuring that only those uh, aligning with our main plan make it through. Is it always uh, clearly described, ideally described? Actually, no, but uh, anyway, it helps us to save our time as it decreases the general number of uh, requests. We see that uh, some needs are not so highly wanted uh, to make a request to spend time on the intake description. And we also don't have to spend our time, uh, our time to uh, clarify all the details that are initially missed and uh, not filled in. And for the submitted intakes, uh, we do understand many more details from the scratch. So as I've said, we are saving our time and make our requesters more responsible uh, of um, the requests they are sent into our product team. Um, the third point is business value measurement. That's still a tricky point for us, but uh, we are sure that when it goes about business, value should be measured in money and backlog items should be prioritized based on this parameter. For the system like ours, money can be uh, spared uh, within the system due to processes, automation and decrease in manual work and its costs within the, or within the compliance risk reduction. Also, money can be earned when it goes about efficient data usage by third-party apps that are bundled with ours. Uh, whether an idea saves time, reduces costs, or contributes to earnings, these are the metrics we use to see through possibilities. It's a practical approach focusing on tangible impact. Um, then I'd like to tell a few words about MVP usage. It's um, our uh, fourth focus. Uh, minimum viable product uh, is a well-known approach that we apply now to our business requests and we formulate uh, the hypothesis and within post-analysis phase may estimate whether we are approaching the goals or not, whether the goal is still valid and we should add several more components to reach it. Incremental approach allows us to deliver and uh, get users' feedback quickly. Based on the feedback received, plan and prioritize the development of uh, subsequent increments. And uh, the last uh, but not the least, our uh, fifth um, power uh, is including technical depth in product backlog. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, Technical depth uh, related stories are crucial for maintaining the set. They ensure a smooth experience for our users, preventing issues that could hinder our product's performance. And it's about balancing innovation and sustainability. Technical depth related stories are of the same value as business ones. We do need to measure and estimate them together with our uh, functional epics. Uh, so, uh, as we conclude this journey, imagine a future where our backlog is not just a place for ideas, but a dynamic force driving innovation. Uh, let me remind uh, the points I've just um, mentioned, and uh, uh, this uh, proactive approach to product development. Don't try to fit all users' requests to a backlog. Collaborate, research, and focus on the product strategy, strategy first of all. Then uh, it's intakes usage. Provide a tool allowing new requests to come with the described business value and impact. 
divide intakes by clock and product by clock. It really helps. The third is business value measurement. Language of earnings and costs helps uh, to reasonably prioritize your backlog. The fourth is uh, MVP and incremental approach. Deliver product within increments, bringing value to the customers within short iterations. And the fifth is uh, treating technical debt as, uh, important, as, a, as an important one. Technical stories matter. Prioritize them within the product backlog, realizing their final value. So thank you for joining me on this exploration. I believe that um, now we are ready to answer questions. If we do have some, uh, let us check. Roman is back. Hey guys, thank you so much for um, for quite valuable um, insights into how to drive the change. Mm -hmm. um, just give me a few seconds. I'm gonna probably shoot questions in an order that you are guys um, speaking to. So the first question is for uh, Irina. Um, have you experienced any communication issues uh, within the product teams? Um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, of course, um, where I have been, uh, we all uh, human after all, but uh, usually, um, usually uh, we can talk about our value and about goals and we uh, we corrected uh, some problems or questions and discussions and uh, if uh, people uh, are together uh, they can do more than than it's not in a team Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, there is a similar question. How did the stakeholders react to your initiatives? Uh, <laughs> uh, Raman, <laughs> could you uh, choose something more, no, not, not so interesting? <laughs> uh -huh. Initially, um, they were skeptical, but um, over time, uh, they recognized the value of the changes intakes, uh, roadmaps, and uh, they invested uh, a lot of time uh, to our workshops and communications, and I think it's very good. And when we talk about the timing, um, okay, I just lost Rina, but maybe she's still here. Okay, um, then we can proceed. Um, Andre, Andre was next. Um, so is there a few? Okay, even is back. Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna shoot one more question. When we talk about the timeline, uh, how much time did it, uh, did the change take? Taking um, your example, I guess. Yep. Uh, thank you. Um, it depends. Yeah, because teams are different. Uh, product are different i think uh six uh months uh, um, is a good uh, result for transformation for uh first global step for forming uh a product mindset awesome thank you so much um i also seen a few questions um for andre um andre um so I mean, there are also similar questions like um, okay. how did the team take change and how long it can take so maybe you can also share your uh, thoughts on that one um, how did the team react to these changes <laughs> oh of course first uh, reaction was uh, you are crazy <laughs> guys you are crazy <laughs> well 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 how you imagine of it uh, how you imagine it uh, okay we have uh, 15 teams uh, with expertise on different components uh, and so many different programming languages java c plus plus c sharp python golang uh, and uh, different frameworks uh, and 
to be autonomous and and to end uh, these teams have to be 20 people <laughs> uh, to have 20 people to gather together all of this expertise from all these languages uh, and uh, uh, one other popular concern, uh, do you really think the developers and engineers uh, will ever care about business issue, about business needs, uh, and so on and so on, uh, lots of similar objections, lots of concern, uh, but uh, always they are similar. And uh, the teams are different, the companies are different, the context uh, uh, is different, but the concerns are the same. Uh, and it's natural for us to fear the, and even resist changes to, because they bring something unknown, maybe something risky, and someone is open to new experience and uh, looks at it with interest and uh, with open mind, uh, and someone is uh, uh, very difficult to get out uh, of the comfort zone, and uh, uh, even someone fears to uh, to lose uh, his authority. Someone uh, fears to lose power. Uh, someone. Uh, uh, so we are all human beings, and uh, in such situations, it's very important to find supporters of changes within teams, within organization, uh, and uh, some like. Uh, find agent of changes uh, within company who can join uh, work groups and uh, to work out changes to to work out blueprints uh, and of course uh, to work with people it's uh, essential uh, to to speak uh, in groups individually to explain to help the, to understand to to find uh, to try to help to find new interesting opportunities for uh, for team members, for people, for their careers, uh, uh, and so on. Yeah, it's always difficult. Uh, so I would like to uh, take this opportunity to recommend a good book about changes and uh, uh, reaction to it. Uh, Our Iceberg is Melting by John Cotter. Uh, it's a simple story about doing well under the stress and uh, uh, uncertainty of rapid changes and uh, it's really good book and really story I recommend. Awesome, thank you. Uh, also, there is another interesting question and I guess uh, we've mentioned the word change for like a hundred of times by now, so that question is even more relevant. But um, from your personal experience, um, do you recall any examples when it's better to leave things as they are and don't introduce a new change? Oh, real examples. Uh, not implement uh, these radical changes. Um, I can say that for significant change, for uh, radical changes uh, to be successful in any company, there must be a request from uh, must be a request for change, and of course uh, it will it should be support uh, of the company top management. It is impossible to transform anyone, transform any organization from the outside. The company management uh, must clearly understand why. Uh, in our rapidly changing VUCA world, it's important to be adaptive, to have uh, uh, time to, to, to react quickly to external challenges, to market changes, to, to uh, not uh, to lag behind, but to get ahead of the competitors. Uh, uh, and it is a question of success. It is a question of survival sometimes. Uh, but, uh, for example, if your product is already at the final stage of its life and uh, you don't uh, plan to actively develop, develop this product uh, and if you're satisfied with everything, then you have no request to be more adaptive, to be more faster and you don't want any radical changes. 
but request it is important uh, we can change something if we have request mm -hmm. awesome thank you andre and um, uh, wrapping it up i also have a few questions for um irina I was talking about the backlog management just give me a second i love them yeah um irina which effect in terms of backlog management do you see right now in such a short period and we can't hear you we don't hear you okay sorry <laughs> now i'm online i believe um okay not so much time uh, has passed uh, um, after this uh, recent transformation uh, but uh, i believe that uh, we do already deliver things faster uh, because we use uh, uh, mvp and uh, hypothesis testing and uh, we do deliver uh, something that is really required by um, our users because we measure our business priority effectively and uh, prioritize the backlog items accordingly so we do not uh, just uh, uh, listen uh, to to the um, uh, loudest voices of our customers but uh, we have reasonable a uh, reasonable tool to measure the business value and uh, to plan our activities according to this Mm -hmm. And uh, another question um, is about um, challenges. So maybe you can um, say what's the most challenging in a backlog related transformation? Um, maybe top it, one. It's, yeah, so it's easy for me to answer because um, for me, uh, the most challenging uh, the most challenging task was uh, to say goodbye to our old backlog because it was something that uh, has been formed uh, for years. Uh, we have been taking care of it, and uh, each of uh, the tasks that uh, we would never implement uh, was uh, carefully uh, registered and supported. So. Um, uh, now we have started uh, the new backlog uh, um, from scratch uh, based on the new principles. So I'm quite happy having it, but it was really hard to uh, farewell with the old one. You got it. Um, yeah, I think it's always hard to let things go, but <laughs> yeah. maybe it's done for good. Um, and also, probably the final question, uh, I don't know if you answered it, so just please uh, feel free to um, say it, but um, is it transformation you were talking about? Is it experience? Is, is it the first time you're doing it? And how do you feel about it, if so? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, this part of my colleagues uh, who are experienced in uh, such activities, I'm a newcomer uh, in uh, this case. Uh, this is uh, the first uh, transformation uh, for me now. And um, actually, I feel tired and excited at the same time. We are still um, not at the very beginning, but uh, somewhere in the beginning of our way. Um, and uh, I'm really in spite of everything going around. Uh, we have a team adapting to the innovation in uh, a really good manner, I believe. Of course, we face uh, uh, some uh, unpredicted uh, challenges, but anyway, we are, we are dealing with it. And uh, I believe uh, we'll be doing great uh, in short uh, adaptation period. Thank you for these questions. It was a pleasure to answer. Thank you guys. Um, I think we have no more questions. So once again, uh, thank you, Rina, Andre, and Irina for um, sharing your experience with us and with the audience. Also, a huge thank you uh, for everyone who've been sticking around for almost the whole day uh, since it's the last uh, speech and we will be wrapping up the conference shortly, I think. So that was a pleasure having you around and uh, yeah. Um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. Please stick around and um, share your feedback on the community page about the conference and the speech in particular. And I think we'll see you around. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.